Okay, this is an audio because I'm too lazy to get my camera to work right. I never get it to work right. And I can concentrate better on the words if I don't look at a camera. For now. This is about some basics about Islam that I don't see anybody covering in the news. And it's really important to understand that so that you can get a backdrop on what the problem really is so that when you decide who you're going to vote for, you can do it more intelligently, okay? Now, what I'm going to tell you is stuff that I learned when I was majoring in this topic in college. But it just turns out, you know, over the years, I realized that what I was taught was true. And you can verify what I'm saying with whatever outlets you want to use, okay? But what needs to be done and isn't being done is nobody synthesizing the information for the American public, or for the European public for that matter, to understand what's the story here with this Islam thing. So I'm going to try and summarize it. Obviously I'm going to do, you know, a, a substandard job. But there's no one doing it, so substandard is better than nothing. So much for introduction. Okay. This Islam thing that's going on now, is actually a political battle. This is real important to understand. The real story underneath everything. There is a political battle going on between Muslim Arabs to get control for over the hearts and minds of other Muslims. That's the core of it. Number one core of it. That has always been the core of it. I mean, you know, if you know that the Bible is the word of God, God said that very succinctly when he said that Ishmael will be an ass of a man. His hand will be against his brothers and they will be against him. Yeah, that's the core. The sons of Ishmael were deemed by the Arabs as the royal line because his father too was Abraham this is long before there was any issue about Islam and of course you know the Bible's full of saying that the Arabs are going to be the, the enemies they don't talk about Islam they just talk about the Arabs the sons of Ishmael alright now, there are other Arabs that came out of the sons of Ishmael, and the Bible talks about those two. Okay, the Moabites. Okay, the Midianites, who sold Joseph. Okay, they're all related tribes. Okay, in other words, there's a lot of intermarriage that's going on. But the sons of Ishmael are supposed to be the highest group among them, because they're sons of Abraham. Just like Isaac is sons of Abraham. In other words, this whole conflict that we call Islam today isn't really about Islam. It's about one son of Abraham versus another son of Abraham. Now, in the State Department, when they were giving us these lectures on this, they didn't cover that part. Because, you know, they're supposed to be apart from the Bible and all that. What they covered was, hi, in Islam there is a political battle for the hearts and minds of Muslims. In other words, kind of like, you know, in Christianity we had the Reformation. Wait a minute. Sorry about the airplane. Like in Christianity we had the Reformation. They're going through something like that now. Okay, you really got to understand the, the undercore of it. There have always been certain nations amongst the Arabs that have tried to be the leader of all Muslims, including and especially Muslim Arabs, throughout history. Okay, Saudi Arabia, because it's the home of the Hajj. Got to look up Hajj to understand what it is. It's the one thing that every Muslim is supposed to do in his lifetime. Okay, H-A-G-G, J-J. H-A-J-J. -J. 
because Saudi Arabia is the home of the Hajj, it has pretty much been the Catholicism, called Sunni, in Islam. And they're using their location to try and assert a kind of leadership role over all Muslims all over the world. That's what they're trying to do. That's their claim to fame. Oh, you know, you as a Muslim, you should be looking up here. And what we, you know, we give you lots of money and we fund your mosque. And by the way, they fund almost all the terrorism. But we look nice to the West. And so they want to basically be the leaders of Islam. And they're pretty good at it. By contrast, you got Iran. Now, Iran didn't used to be and is, you know, a leader. Because it used to have a lot more ties to the West and, you know, it was under Shah Pavlavi and all the rest of it. But, of course, you know, with the, with the militant clerics taking over and everything, um, that was, you know, pretty much where they are today. Iran is trying to outdo Saudi Arabia. Now, then you always had lesser players in there too. The lesser players have been Libya, Northern Africa, Egypt, Syria, and Syria and Iraq. Okay, those guys have always been sort of jockeying for position, but they represent, um, as it were, Protestant equivalent Islam minorities, like the Alawites, which run Syria, that's what Assad belongs to. Then you have um, the Shiites, okay, which is most of Iraq. Then you and the, and then you have um, you know kind of like other versions and sects that are there. You have the Druzes in Lebanon, for example. Lebanon's another area, but Lebanon's been chiefly controlled by Syria most of this time. Anyway, so you have Syria, Egypt. Lebanon, which is part of Syria, really, um, and Iraq, all sort of balancing off Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. So they're going through a breakup. They call it the Arab Spring. They're going through a breakup, and it's a political breakup of them fighting with each other. See, Bible, Ishmael, donkey... His hand will be against his brothers, and his brothers will be against him. Okay? That's the history of the Arabs. Long before Islam came along. This is the core. Now, Islam comes along because one of the anti-Semitic guys named Mohammed just, you know, I'm absolutely convinced at this point, one of Satan's little lieutenants decided to have some fun and started feeding all this garbage to Muhammad. Okay? Because it's a little too clever about how it can read the Bible and understand scripture to be something a human could do. Now, whether Muhammad was illiterate or not, as the Arabs say or the Muslims say, I don't know. Whether it was his Persian, you know... Um, eminences or uh, how do you say that word um, that helped him I don't know okay what I do know is that the book itself with the text itself was way too clever to be merely of human origin and if I live long enough I'll, I'll try to show why I say that in any event the point is is that Islam just furnished a new occasion for the Arabs to all fight with each other and yet fight against Israel because it's really brother against brother. The two sons of Abraham. Okay? The one thing, and this has been known to the State Department forever, the one thing that all the Arabs can unite them around is to hate Israel. And that's why you have the PLO Charter with the number one article is that, you know, Israel has no right to exist. Okay, that's one thing they all have in common. Any Muslim anywhere that reads the Quran is anti-Semitic. You really do have to be anti-Semitic in your soul to even begin to buy into it. Now, anti-Semitism, like anything else, can change. 
I mean, and the next thing you need to know about is that the children of the next generation can see it. In other words, if you're a Muslim, you're growing up Muslim, and you see your parents be anti-Semitic, and you see your parents be, you know, rabid about destroying Israel, and yet telling you that Islam is a re religion of peace, you begin to put two and two together and realize that there's something that's not right here. My parents are lying to me. And a whole bunch of kids stuck in Islam and in Arab homes and in non-Arab homes, you know, because you got Croatia and Indonesia, other places of the world where Islam is real popular. Some parts of China. The kids growing up see that anti-Semitism in their parents. And they see the contradictions in the Quran. You know, being told it's good, and then on the other hand, how brutal it is. The kids start to think, oh, something's wrong here. Now, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents changed religion like you change clothing. So it wasn't always Christian by their standards. But they were anti-Semitic, okay? And my cousins and I, we, when we finally were adults, we, we realized that we looked back on our childhood and it was like, how come our parents were so anti-Semitic? And we all came to the same conclusions, but we never talked about it as kids. We talked about it as adults. Now, don't you think some kind of parallel like that might be going on within the children of all these Arab and Muslim horrible people? Meanwhile, with Saudi Arabia fighting Iran because now Gaddafi's gone and now Hussein is gone and now Assad is nearly gone and now bin Laden's gone. Don't you think that, you know, Saudi Arabia and Iran are sort of duking it out for who gets to be top dog? And you know who's going to win. It's going to be Saudi Arabia. But you got all those kids. And not just kids, but other people within Islam who dare not say anything openly. They go through the motions of sticking the butt up in the air five times a day. But their heart's not in it. But they don't have any out. Because one thing Islam is, is tyrannical. There's no such thing as a moderate Muslim. You're either a Muslim or you're not a Muslim. You're a good Muslim or you're a wish you could get out of it Muslim. There's, no, there's nobody else. Okay, so now, you see how complicated the picture becomes? On the one hand, it's a political fight, really between Saudi Arabia and Iran, that nobody's covering in the news, they should. Once in a while, you'll see somebody allude to it. But this is a well-known thing. It was well-known 30-some years ago when I was in college. 40 years ago now. I learned it there. We had lectures from Abba Iban and the State Department and all this other stuff. And they went on circus. I was, you know, ours wasn't the only school. So this was well known back then. So it's still a battle now. That's one layer in this whole Islam thing. The the bottommost layer is the Bible story. It's really brother against brother using whatever mechanisms they can. And it's, you know, the brother who's wrong, of course, is the Arab brother. Because he could have believed in Christ, but chose not to. Ishmael means, I heard God. That was the number, the name his mother gave him. His mother believed in God. Or you can argue it's saying, God hears. It can work both ways. It, dual entendre. Okay? So his mother heard God and said God hears. You get that funny thing? And the kid's name is Ishmael, but it really should be Ishmael because that's what the world is hearing from him. That's bottommost layer. Next, the political battle between who's going to speak for Islam. A kind of reformation going on amongst the Arabs in the name of Islam. 
Saudi Arabia versus Iran currently. There were more players, but they're sort of like out now because we have what's called, thanks to W. Bush, best president we've ever had, we now have an Arab Spring. And the Arabs who are tyrannized underneath this Islam banner are now tr freer, more free to get out of it. Okay, but the trouble is that they are still Muslim. They are still anti-Semitic. They're just now starting to wake up to the tyranny they've been under. They don't yet know that it's the Quran that's tyrannizing them. That it's Islam that's tyrannizing them. They don't know that yet. They've been under the pressure for so long and yes they're guilty and yes they're anti-Semitic and all the rest of it but they're just now getting a chance to breathe some other questioning. And there have been a lot of converts to Christianity. Not a lot in terms of percentage, but a lot in terms of numbers. And the, they, when they convert, they're very vociferous about it. About how bad Islam is. And of course, all you have to do is go to the YouTube videos, Muslim conversion to Christianity, and just, just watch any of them. I have a whole playlist on that if you want to look at my playlist on YouTube called Muslim Conversions. Okay? And those are people's other videos, you know, from all over the YouTube that I collected over the years, and I'm still collecting them. But, see, that's the next layer up, is that with all this fighting going on, thanks to W, W, you know, George W. Bush, Jr., Jr., thanks to him, and, you know, his advisors, we started really fighting. What, and they kept on splitting out, and this is their tactic, which gives me the fourth layer. But the third layer is there are a lot of conversions that can come out of it. There's a lot of questioning, and the Arab Spring comes out of it. Arab Spring means the start of growing, growing out of the tyranny that they've been in for centuries. So the fourth layer up is, you know, a political awakening, the Arab Spring, giving rise to a personal and spiritual awakening. Now, that kind of thing, that kind of process, didn't just start overnight, and it didn't just start with W, and it didn't just start with, you know, even World War II, which gave birth to the Arab countries. It started a long time ago. A lot of people start out with a certain belief in a certain religion, Christianity or otherwise, and as they start to grow up, they start to question. And a lot of them, and really pretty much all of us, okay, if we really are honest, at some point we start to realize, oh, wait a minute, what I was taught is wrong. Yeah? So now do you throw out God with the bathwater? Muslims in particular are very emotionally attached to the idea of God. He's, he's sugar daddy and to them. It's a very much of a personal relationship idea that they have. Okay? They really do. The devout ones... You know, it depends on whether you're devout to be political or you're devout to be really spiritual. But the ones who are really, really spiritual about it, God is a personal, it's a personal relationship. That's why it's so hard for a Muslim to change. Plus the Quran says that if you change, somebody should kill you. That, that kind of helps them not to change. So, the fourth layer is the sort of like, the freeing up to the political freedom in the third layer, then starting to ask questions as a result of being freed up, then having this spiritual sort of awakening about it. But the thing that, that all of your pundits are focusing on is that as you start to have that spiritual awakening, okay, 
you're going to sort of like want to turn away from the whole terrorist concept. And what the pundits and even the Republicans in W's cabinet when he was here and Obama too, for that matter, what the pundits and the politicians are trying to do here is they're trying to play the same game with all of Islam that Saudi Arabia and Iran are trying to play. Their idea is to divide up the Muslim community into factions. Into factions. All arguing over the same topic. What is the true voice of Islam? So what the president has done, today's president and Bush's in the past, what they've all started to do ever since, you know, really ever since this whole issue with Islam against Israel started in 1948, is they've started saying, well, the terrorist elements of Islam are radical. In other words, they're painting them as fringe. Just like Catholicism back in, during the Reformation would paint the Protestants as fringe. Okay? You paint them as fringe while you don't really speak for, in the Catholic case, you don't speak for Christianity, we do, we're the Catholic Church. Okay, now the idea that, that both the Saudi Arabia and our, our American politicians and pundits are doing is saying, well, you don't, you radical, 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 protesting, protesting Muslims don't really speak for Islam. So Saudi Arabia is aligning itself with the West in order to defeat Iran, who's siding with the what is being marginalized as radical, but really is true Islam. And Iran knows that. And so Iran is saying to, to all the Muslims all over the world, well, we're really the true Islam. To be a true Muslim means to be radical. To be a true Muslim means to be violent. That's what Muhammad was. That's what bin Laden was. So the argument is who speaks for Islam? And the West is basically siding with Saudi Arabia, saying that, oh, if, if you're violent, never mind that Saudi Arabia also supports the terrorists, if you're violent, well, you don't speak for true Islam because Islam means peace. It really doesn't. It means surrender. It's got the same meaning in Arabic that it does in Hebrew. Shalom. Everybody says, oh, that means peace. No, it means surrender. And it's used that way in the Bible all the time. We know it as the doctrine of reconciliation. But reconciliation means you're at war and you give in. That's surrender. Islam means surrender. Shalom means surrender. As a result of surrender, you're at peace. So the fourth layer, the politicization of the freedom, the bubbling up spring of freedom, both political and spiritual, this fourth layer is to start direct all this new freedom to one of one one of two camps the radical camp represented by Iran or the conservative camp represented by Saudi Arabia but Saudi Arabia is hedging both of them by funding the terrorists too and unfortunately the west is aware of this okay because again what I'm telling you I learned 40 years ago also the West is siding with Saudi Arabia because they're trying to pick the lesser of two evils and they basically think that they can out you know outmaneuver Saudi Arabia in the end largely because they think that if they could keep on playing nice they can get you know the oil reserves and get their use of the oil while they try to develop other reserves or other mechanisms of energy and by the time Saudi Arabia is out of oil and therefore out of political power 
then they've managed to, you know, play the cards well to keep Iran at bay. Saudi Arabia knows that. Hell, I know that. If they don't know that, they're too dumb to live. So, of course, they know that. So they're battling. The Saudis are thinking, okay, well, you think you're going to get control of us, but we are probably going to get control of you, and we really want to take over the world in the name of Saudi Arabia and reestablish the caliphate, because that's their goal, before our oil runs out. You see? That's why we don't use our own reserves. You know, like Bush is not using our own, wasn't using our own oil reserves in the United States. And everybody said, well, why don't we do that? Well, because if we use up the Saudi oil reserves first, then they won't have a political leg to stand on. Because they'll have no economic base. Now, Nixon was the first guy who understood that back in the 1970s. That's why OPEC was born. It's the Americans and the Saudis trying to play against each other to see who can get, who can use whose assets to rule out who's going to go under first. The Saudis expect the West to go under first. The West expect the Saudis to go under first. And I wish I could remember the book where all this was disclosed. It was, it, it's something about OPEC in 1974 and the cover is hardback and it's sort of purplish. I had to do a paper on it when I was in my first year of college. But you, somebody will know about that book. You'll be able to find it. The point is that the actual battle is very different from what we're all told. It's proxies. Everything is proxies. In the middle are all these dumb bunny Muslims who don't know the Quran well enough to know that yes, Iran is representing true Islam. And they're buying the Saudi line, because Saudi doesn't want it to have want terrorism in it either. They're buying the Saudi line and oh Islam is peace. Meanwhile we're funding the terrorists. And most of your Muslims are buying the Saudi line. Okay? which is very comparable to the Catholic Church. You know, watered-down Islam really is what it is. But that's not the heart of it. They're just selling it that way so that the West will, you know, comply. So all of your dumb bunny Muslims are in the middle. The actual root, again, is that Saudi versus Iran... Saudi is making nice. Iran is really representing what the Quran says a true Muslim ought to be. Saudi is making nice and pretending to play footsie with the West while funding most of the world's terrorism and especially the PLO. And they're making nice so that they can get the Muslims, especially Arabs, to go along with Saudi Arabia in order to win against Iran. And the West is well aware of this, at least the United States State Department was 40 years ago. They're well aware of this and they're thinking they can beat Saudi Arabia at its own game so that they don't win either and Iran doesn't win either and they just all run out of oil just in time and then America is left standing and along with the West too. Okay? To wit and therefore all this Arab Spring and to wit and therefore all of this, what do you want to call it, fermentation with Muslims suddenly finding out, whoa, golly, this is what the Quran really says? Because half of them don't know. And a whole bunch of them are defecting, converting to Christianity or to atheism. And a whole bunch of them are like, oh, well, where do we go now? But they're still anti-Semitic. They don't know anything about good government because they've been tyrannized for so long. Yeah. 
and still the battle for them is raging even if they stay Muslim what kind of Muslim is Muslim now adding all that into the mix you're going to end up having a wide variety of human personal adherences that's why you had the San Bernardino shooting all this you know uproar radicalized whoever that guy was it's Farouk or something and his dip, dippy wife whether she radicalized him or he was radicalized and therefore married her who's to say but you can just tell oof, these people are crazy they're gonna be they're gonna be a number of people in the United States and in Europe who are otherwise you know not interested in being violent suddenly becoming interested in being violent because their world is shaken up too much that's going to be a reaction by some some people just can't deal with the world being turned upside down without going ballistic and I mean that's not restricted to Islam but it's more curried because Islam really does command you to kill the infidel. I don't know of another holy book that says that. So you've got that end of the spectrum, but then you've got another end of the spectrum that's making this so complicated. A whole bunch of Muslims, like I said, are leaving, they're converting to Christianity. A whole bunch of them are converting to atheism, or at least agnosticism. And you got videos about all that all over YouTube. So just go look there. But there's another couple of segments that are growing out of this that the West is sort of trying to cultivate because the battle is who speaks for Islam. And there are a bunch of groups coming out now who still call themselves Muslims. They still believe that, that they're the true version of Islam. Okay? But... They don't think, this is real important, they don't think that Saudi Arabia speaks for Islam. They don't think Iran speaks for Islam. They uh, very much don't agree with any of the terrorism. In fact, what they do think is that someone corrupted the Koran. And that someone corrupted that, what are called the Hadith, which is kind of like the Talmud equivalent for Islam. That those things are corrupted. There are a whole bunch of Muslims who still do the five times a day butt up in the air thing. They're very devout about it. They don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't play with girls who do. They don't have, you know, five minute marriages. Okay, they believe really in one wife. They are very adamant about cutting out those portions of the Quran which are terrorist. They don't believe that Muhammad wrote those parts. They don't believe in the Hadith at all. Okay, they're sort of made fun of in Islam. I'm not quite sure what's the Arabic term for them, but we would call them fundies. It's just the Quran, and it's not even all the Quran that's just the Quran. That the Quran got messed up, and we're out to bring back the Quran to purity. There are a bunch of people like that who are indeed Muslims. And they don't want anything to do with Saudi Arabia. And they don't want anything to do with the terrorism. And they don't want anything to do with Iran. They regard all those people as apostate. They don't want the Alawites. They don't want the Sufi. They don't want the Sunni. They don't want any of those people. There are like a, a growing number of Muslims in and of themselves that have no denomination. Now the West really wants to, what do you want to call it, cater to these people. Because the, the, the strategy in the West is to beg the question of what constitutes true Islam. Because, first of all, especially in America, we want to say that we're a home for religious freedom. And the Quran, as written, really isn't religious. It's not a religious book. It's a terrorist manifesto. 
But to say that means that you have to what? Incarcerate all the Muslims in the United States? Or Canada? Or Europe? Nobody, I mean, we don't even have the manpower to do that. Much less the inclination. So the smarter tack that's been taken by presidents for the last 50 years has been, well, what constitutes real Islam? And then anything terrorist or violent is called apostate Islam, abusive Islam. Going against the Quran. And Saudi Arabia has pretty much kissed up to that. Even though they support it the other way around too. They support the violence. Because they're trying to, they need Israel to be the enemy. In order to maintain their own power. So... The tactic in the U.S. with the pundits and the politicians now who are saying, you know, talking against Donald Trump, who's saying, well, you know, no Muslims should come into this country now until they are vetted. That's what he's really saying. And I'm not saying I support him because I actually don't like the guy. I don't know if I'll vote for him or not, but I don't like him. Okay, but that's not the point. The point is the claim. Do you let Muslims at all into this country? He's saying, no, vet them first. That's what he's saying. And there's a whole uproar amongst other Republicans, and of course the Democrats too. Oh, well, Trump is a Nazi. Blah, 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 blah. Well, they have to say that, even if they agree with him. And a lot of them do agree with him. But they have to talk against him, because otherwise it, it destroys... The political web that they've woven for so many years now. We have to marginalize the violent Muslims from regular Muslims so that the Muslims, as they already want to do, can fight against each other over what constitutes true Islam. So as long as they're fighting with each other, they're not fighting with us. You see that strategy? Now my question is, Trump is no dummy. Did he know he was going to create this firestorm when he made his little remark? I bet he did. And notice how by creating that firestorm, he gets more press, because that way he doesn't have to pay for it, for himself. Because really people, when they walk into the voting box, they don't vote based on policy. They don't understand policy. They vote based on the candidate they like. So he's more popular. So he's more liked. So he's more likely to become president. So he's no dummy by doing this. Meanwhile, all the pundits and the politicians of the establishment, even even the Republicans, have to keep towing the party line that keeps begging the question, what is Muslim? What is is Islam. Who has the right to speak for Islam? Who is a true Muslim? And the goal is, of course, to say that anybody who's a radical Muslim is not a true Muslim. So that the Muslims who don't know their Quran, that are already here in the United States, don't feel targeted, don't get targeted, and start to be more patriotic in the name of Islam. You see that gambit? See how clever it is? And my question is, does Trump know what I just said to you in this 40 minutes well enough to have purposely said what he did in order to stir it up? So that the West does not look like it's, uh, what do you want to call it, monolithic. And I don't know the answer to that. But one way or another, you see now what the issues are? You can't just really ban all the Muslims. Because what kind of Muslims are they? If they're in this country and not under Sharia law, then they've got more freedom to question whether Islam is even the right thing to believe in. 
So my solution is, hi, talk about the Quran. You can go to Quran.com and just start reading it. You can go to OpenBurhan.com and just start reading it. I don't suggest you go pretty much anywhere else because you have to make sure it's not controlled by Muslims. You can go to USC. I'll put links in the video description. And just start reading it. Read the Quran yourself. Know what it says, especially Surah 2, the Kao Surah, Surah 7, Surah 19, Miriam, Surah 22, Surah let's see, 279, gotta get 9, um, 1922. Okay? They're written out of chronological order, just like our Bibles are compiled out of chronological order. Go to FFI Forum. Just start researching and reading the Quran itself. And start, if you have any Muslim friends, talk to them about it. Get them to talk about it. That's the best thing you can do. Because that way you know how to talk to God about what to do about this situation. And frankly, what I've asked him to do is to kill capture, maim, harm, any of the Muslims who are guilty. And to deliver, protect, save any of the Muslims or non-Muslims affected by this, who of course are innocent. And the Muslims too need to be awakened and to convert them. That's the third prong of what I pray to them. Now maybe you want to pray that. That's the real solution to this problem. Because as you can see from this 40 some minute discussion, well, not discussion, but review. It's a thorny problem, and it's political. Saudi Arabia wants to reestablish the caliphate. They've never really had control of it. They want to get control of it. You know, from the Ottoman Empire, which really started in 1453. They want their turn in the sun. They've never had that. Iran! would like, of course, to have the Persian Empire now be Islamicized, and they want their turn in the sun. Return to the great Persian Empire. The Iranians are not Arabs. In fact, they hate the Arabs. But they are mostly Muslim now. Okay? That's the big brouhaha. All politics is local, and this is how they retain control over their own peoples. Only this time the whole of Islam is brought into focus. And then the big question is, well, what is being a good Muslim? Now, how are you going to know the answer to that question? How are you going to pray like I just prayed? Maybe you shouldn't pray what I prayed. Maybe you should pray something more specific. How are you going to know? Get the Quran and start reading it. Get the Bible on Ishmael and start reading it. Talk to God. And then anything that I've said, you know, go look it up on Google. It's, there's all kinds of places to go. Another book that I would recommend would be Sir John Glubb's A Short History of the Arab Peoples, which, you know, when I was talking about that college course I had back 40 years ago, that was one of the books that we, were, we had to read. So that was a textbook for us. So go get that. It's in uh, Amazon. Okay. The guy who wrote it is pro-Islam. Okay, so it's not like you're reading, you know, some hatred site. Go to Muslims. Go to the Quran. Go to pro-Muslim pro discussions. But you better really read it because they're taught to lie. They think that's being uh, good-mannered. So check out everything I have said for sense, for truth. Google, ask questions, dispute, go to Quran.com, go to OpenBurhan.com, or get a copy of the Quran, I'm sure you can find one, and read it. And above all, talk to God. Use 1 John 1 9. Ask Father and Son's name for what you think should be done. It's good practice, it's good kingship and training. Do it.